Hello, everyone. If you are out in the exhibit area, um, if you want to go ahead and make your way back into the main room, we're going to uh, welcome our last speaker to the podium. Also, just one more reminder that please fill out the survey that was handed out during the break and just leave it on the table. That will really help us with our reporting for our granting agency. And again, today's event was made possible by the American Library Association, Reforma, and our own Title V um, office here at CC Point. So. All right, I am so uh, excited to introduce our last speaker today and also just to thank all of you for being here and speaking around all day long. Um, we've heard so many interesting stories so far and I'm sure uh, Dr. Gonzalez is also going to share some really wonderful information with us. So let me introduce our next speaker. So uh, Nikki Gonzalez, is a professor of history and vice provost for diversity and inclusion at Regis University. Um, she was born and raised in Denver, but her family had roots in Southern Colorado. And her history uh, specializes in history of the American West, specifically the history of Mexican land grants and social movements in Southern Colorado and Chicano history. And uh, she has some uh, projects that she's been working on recently that I think she's going to talk to us about. So, uh, with no further ado, please help me welcome Nikki Gonzalez. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for staying. I know the last presentation today is sometimes a little bit hard to stay for, but I appreciate you staying. And I first want to start with thank yous to um, Charlene, Rhonda, Joelle, Tom, and the rest of the CSU Pueblo staff, including the custodial staff and the catering staff, the students who have welcomed me today, and um, all the other speakers who made this, this gathering possible. So thank you. I was asked, Charlene asked me if I would come and talk a little bit about the importance of historical preservation. And I thought I would talk about a story that I've been deeply involved in really for the last 20 years as a graduate student and a continual researcher. And then a couple other examples, and then one recent project that I've been involved in with the city of Denver. But I'd like to begin as I have begun um, this past year when I was serving as state historian. I dedicated all of my work as state historian for the past year. Um, to my mater paternal grandmother, Margaret Ivan Gonzalez, who I never knew, um, but whose life I have come to know much better, much clearer picture within the past year by talking to people who shared bits and pieces of her story and have been able to put them together. Um, and I, when I think of her, um, and when I think about history and history preservation, a quote from James Baldwin comes to mind, and this is worth repeating. I often start my talks with this. In 1965, James Baldwin, whose prophetic voice has really resurfaced in the post George Floyd murder era, what, what people are calling the racial reckoning. But he wrote an essay in 1965 in Ebony Magazine, and the essay was called White Man's Guilt. And in it, he wrote about the pervasive power of history. The, the whole quote is just a piece of it, but the entire quote says, history, as, no one near, as nearly no one seems to know, is not merely something to be read, and it does not refer merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us. We are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. It could scarcely be otherwise, since it is to history that we owe our frames of reference, our identities, and our aspirations. So let's begin with the story. On August 18, 1980, in a tiny windowless adobe building in the hamlet of Orito, Colorado, the leaders of the Land Rights Council of San Luis 
called a meeting to introduce their new legal strategy. They were there to introduce an idealistic young attorney who had come of age in the time of Lyndon Johnson's unconditional war on poverty under the Legal Aid Program. This attorney, Jeff Goldstein, would remain with the community in their fight until 2002, and even a little bit after. The Land Rights Council leaders, Shirley Romero Otero, Ray Otero, and Elder Apolinar Royal, spoke passionately of the injustice in 1965 when the district court took away their community's historic land rights to a landscape called La Sierra, a 77,500 acre mountainous common land. The district judge went so far as to say, those Mexicans need to be brought into the 20th century. For the mountain people of El Rito, also called San Francisco, La Sierra shaped every aspect of life, diet, shelter, recreation, history, and spirituality. Losing legal access was economically and culturally devastating, not only to them, but to the people of the surrounding villages of San Luis, San Pablo, San Pedro, and Chama. Now the activists called on them to join their new lawsuit, Royal B. Taylor, which would challenge that racist 1965 ruling with the goal of winning back their historic land rights. They called on them to pick up the fight once again. When asked to sign on as plaintiffs, however, those in the audience responded with silence. Many of them looked down at their feet, some looked down at their hands, for the American legal system had done them wrong in the past. Why would they trust it now? Why would they pick up the fight when obstacles seemed so insurmountable, when it was hard enough to just make a living each day? Just then, a woman, no taller than four feet, a victim of childhood polio, steadied her crutches in both hands and rose to her feet. Her squeaking metal crutches and her chastising words broke the deafening silence as she lumbered her way to the front of the room. Bueno, cabrones. Si usted hombres no tiene los huevos para firmar, deja mi pasar. For those who don't know Spanish, okay, you bastards, if you men don't have the balls to sign, get out of the way and let me pass. I get the Medina's husband, Ray Medina, followed her to the room. You bet he did. Agatha was the first plaintiff to sign on to the lawsuit, to the legal fight to regain the community's 130-year-old land rights, rights they had been fighting to keep for generations, and now they would have to win back after that 1965 ruling. Ray followed his wife to the front, and others soon followed Ray. Agatha shaped history that night. She would remain a critical presence in the lawsuit, and her husband, in fierce determination, has certainly always inspired me and many others. Her desire to fight for her community's sacred relationship with the mountain they call La Sierra helped propel their community to victory all these years later. Agatha Medina passed away last year in October of 2021 at the age of 78. Why do I begin? Oh, I should say, this is a picture of Agatha and her lifelong friend and fishing and hunting partner. Uh, G. Martinez, two of the most important activists in the, in the Southwest story. And this is a photo that I took in 2014. So why do I start with Agatha's, Agatha's story? I believe her story highlights an important chapter in the civil rights history of our state. Her contribution to the history of the Chicano movement cannot be overstated. Her courage and determination to fight for the cultural and economic survival of her community gives us a truer, richer picture of our state's past it gives us heroic figures to look to in tough times. Agatha's story stayed with me. Learning of her story, especially directly from her and others through oral histories, has helped shape my vocation as an activist historian and my responsibility to use any platform I have to amplify those histories that have been excluded and also to amplify the importance of historic preservation. And this is just a fun quote. So those of you who have read Milagro V. Mildor or perhaps you've seen the, the movie, this is actually a quote from the book. And I think it encapsulates specifically the character of the people of the San Luis area. Um, I was just amazed at the ability, particularly of the elder Spanish-speaking people, 
to just persist against all odds. They didn't have the money, the political power. They didn't have any power with the courts. They just didn't give up. It was quite a lesson. Call it the stoic, solid persistence of a community to sustain its land and its culture, its language, and its customs. So today, as I go through some examples of historic preservation in action, and our examples of the importance of historic preservation, I, I want to kind of touch on these themes. So the first one is, this is a quote from a Chicago activist who I interviewed about her, her life, her life of activism. She said, we tell our stories to make sense of our lives. So in order to make sense of our lives, we need our stories. And in order to have our stories, we need to preserve them. Secondly, the danger of a single story. Some of you may have um, come across the TED Talk by Jonathan and Lucia Adiche, um, where she talks about the danger of a single story and how stories can restore the dignity of a people. Third, preservation of, of history gives us a fuller and sure picture of the past. Just like Agatha's story, had we not preserved that story, we wouldn't have a complete story of the Chicago movement, of Colorado history, and indeed of national civil rights history. In addition, history gives us a repository of wisdom to inform our present and future policies, our actions, and movements for justice in the age, this age of reckoning. And there's one document that really highlights this, and I'll call attention to that when I get to it. And then, of course, our knowing our history, knowing the history of one another, helps us to understand one another. And in our society today, I think we really hunger for an understanding of one another across differences. And then finally, within historic preservation, gathering of historic stories, we really need patience, humility, and healing. So I talked a little bit a couple weeks ago about trauma and how in kind of revisiting so many of these stories, particularly the communities of color, brings up real historic trauma. And some scholars believe that trauma can last. It can actually change genetics. So they study Holocaust um, survivors and their children and grandchildren can actually change the DNA structure of people a couple generations down the road. So we need time for healing. A lot of people want to like rush to reconciliation, but first we need to really heal um, and allow for that. And humility always comes, comes in handy in those situations. And so the examples that I'll talk about today, one is the song based land rights struggle, and I'll spend a little bit more time on this because one is my area of <laughs> one of my areas of research, and two, I think it's really important to go through the context to truly understand it because nobody knows this history and it's very, very complex. Second, and my focus was mostly on Southern Colorado, is the Santa Creek Massacre exhibit at History Colorado, which will be opening in November, reopening, I should say, in November of this year. And then third, the Amache internment camp here in Southern Colorado. And then fourth, um, I was just talking to Wade about the Denver uh, Latino Chicano Mexican American Historic Context project that I was involved in for the city of Denver. I'll touch on that in a little bit. So I'll start with the Song Luis story. So this is a photograph um, of the town of Song Luis in the foreground and two common lands. And then you see also some of the smaller villages. So the, the, the big grassy area is called the Vega. I'll be talking about that. And then you see the mountain range, which is that is La Sierra. So I just wanted to give you a visual of the landscape that I'll be talking about. And so the historic context. So beginning with the, the, the roots of the San Luis land rights struggle, which is still like the courts just made another um, ruling on it um, two weeks ago. I think so we'll get to that. So it's like it never ends. Um, but it has its roots in the Mexican land grants um, system. And it was part of the Sombra de Cristo land grant, which was given um, by Governor, New Mexico Governor Manuel Arrigo, who was part of the Mexican uh, nation at that time. And it was a million acres. And he gave those million acres away in 1843 to two young men. One was a 13 year old boy, and one was a young, a young man from his 20s. And in return, 
those grantees, the people that receive the grant, have to promise to bring people, to bring people who were loyal to Mexico, to Mexico's northern frontier, because guess what? From the east, we have we have Americans, we have French Canadians, we have Russians coming from, from the west, um, who are just chomping at the bit to get into that area to establish some power and some authority. Um, they benefit from the rich trade. And so that was the goal behind the Mexican land grant system. And here is a map. And in the dark, the dark shaded areas, it's not a great map, but uh, these are the Mexican land grants. And these were granted between 1821 and the 1840s. So again, creating that buffer zone of people who are loyal to the Mexican nation. We promised to bring people and to bring industry onto that territory. And the Sangre de Cristo land grant is kind of smooshed in the middle, and you can see. Um, just under the Sangre de Cristo Mountains label there. And intervening, we have a, a, an event that you know, changed the landscape entirely, the Mexican-American War. So it was fought from 1846 to 1848. If you know the history of the war, it, it was essentially a war of conquest. President Polk, you know, saw dollar signs, he saw potential gold in California, there were rumors of gold before the gold rushing started, and he knew that there were rich copper deposits in what is today Arizona and Mexico. So it was a war of conquest, it was a manufactured war. As a result, um, the, treat, the war ended with the Treaty of Barbara de Hidalgo, and this is, which involved the secession of huge areas of land. So the American Southwest, is what would become the American Southwest, essentially became the American Southwest as a result of the Mexican-American War. And that means the communities um, that we're talking about today, okay, Southern Colorado. Um, so what do we do? Like we have this land grant system, um, which kind of clashes with the American system of private property. And what you have is essentially a clash of land systems. And so I'll get into how the land was divided up in a minute, but I want to introduce you to Article 8 of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which said, in the said territories, property of any kind now belonging to Mexicans now established there shall be inviolably respected. The present owners, the heirs of these, and all Mexicans who may hereafter acquire said property by contact, contract shall enjoy with respect to it guarantees equally ample as if the state belonged to the citizens of the United States. So keep this in mind when we get to 2002 and the Colorado Supreme Court ruling, really, okay? Article 8, promise to protect Mexican land rights. Um, and get into how the land was distributed. So eventually a man named Carlos Mogollon acquired the land, the, the one million acre land grant from his son, and then the other man just happened to be his, his son in law. And so they were they were killed in the massacre in Taos. You can see their, their history. And so Carlos Obion has this land, and he begins to, about 1849 ish, 1850, to talk to locals, um, begins to distribute two types of land, two types of land rights. One is bar strips, and these are individual plots. So say Rhonda is a single man, say she's a single man, she applies for 50 bar strips, okay? And then Tom, you are a married man, you have a family, you get 100 bar strips. But these bar strips are only 33.5 inches long, or wide, I'm sorry. But they can be miles long. So 50 times 33 inches, um, you know, miles long. So it's very different than the American system, but it is a type of land distribution that allowed for more people to have access to a mountain landscape, which is all, all sorts of benefits of that. And then also access to water, so they could be along a ditch, okay? And so you could access that water um, through an Asequia system. And you can see still on the San Luis landscape, um, if you look really closely in this photograph far away, you can see fences that are still marking those forest strips. So people still operate, they still own forest strips, the original forest strips. Um, so I mentioned the Asequia system, this is important too. So in San Luis, where there's about eight inches of precipitation a year, a big year, um, water is the lifeblood. Water is essential. And this is a quote from Joseph Gallegos, who passed away a few years ago, but he was an activist in some ways. 
He said he was still a man's wife, but never his water. He had so to show you how important water was. And then Carlos Obion also distributed land, communal land rights. Okay, so two mejitos, uh, common land areas. One is that Vegas strip that I showed you, that green area um, just between the town of San Luis and the other smaller villages. And that was winter pasture. So people could not sheep, but they could graze their cattle and their horses in that area. As long as they promise not to use up all the resources and promise to maintain, um, you know, the fences and so forth. And then La Siena, which is the big landscape that we're talking that's at the heart of this land, this land rights controversy. And that is mountainous up with lands. Think of it like um, a grocery store. Okay, so the community would get everything it needed basically to survive, including water. So it depended on, you know, very slow summer runoff from the water to to water their um, to water their harvesters, their crops. They hunted, they gathered wood for both timber and for, for lumber purposes for building, but and recreation. So it represented everything that the people needed. So think about when, when those land rights are terminated, how devastating that was economically for the people. Okay, so again, yeah, just to remind you of the landscape there. So Bodian. Go back a little bit, sorry, it's a little bit out of order. So in 1863, Carlos Bobian, so who is the, the owner of this land grant, so it's, it's weird, like he owns this common land that people have rights to. So get your mind around that before we proceed any further. So in 1863, he's on his deathbed, he knows he's dying. And so agreements that were previously made on a handshake. Okay, and I've seen some of the documents that once they were written down, maybe the person was illiterate and would sign with an X. Um, but all of those agreements were then written down, including the agreement with the entire community. So it says, and it's written in Spanish, it says, the lands of the Rito Centro, which is another um, name for La Sierra, shall remain uncultivated for the benefit of the community of San Luis. All the inhabitants will have enjoyment of benefits of pastures, water, firewood, and timber, always taking care that one does not injure the other. So think about that, right? So not only do we have this common land, land rights, use rights, but it's also there's environmental ethos here, which I, I call communal environmentalism. It's a code, it's an ethos, it's an agreement that there will be practices that would make the most out of the use of the land for the benefit of future generations. So it's not exploited. So that's central to this, this case. And I should also tell you that so many of the documents, and this gets to the preservation part of this, so many of the documents that I was working with in the late 90s and early 2000s were just like, there was no protocol with the clerk's office. And we could just grab a shoebox with your greasy hands, you could just touch any of the documents, and they were disintegrating, and it just broke my heart. And I, would, I would report it repeatedly to the Colorado State Archives. But I don't think anything ever came of it. Um, so there's a need for preservation there. Um, here's uh, an example of some preservation that was done in 1939 as part of the WPA project when the federal government hired historians and photographers to do oral histories and to document through photography and so forth um, to some of the communities in Southern Colorado. And this is a real gift. And these were Photos by a pretty famous WPA photographer, Arthur Rothstein, in the Library of Congress collection. And without this program, we wouldn't know really what, what the community looked like in the 1930s. So, um, it's a real thing. So, going back to the story then. So, the community has these weird land rights, okay? The Americans are pouring in, we have land speculators, Colorado becomes a territory in 1861. Um, and so things are, things are about to clash here. And so by the 1870s, um, a man named William Blackmore and William Gilpin, the first territorial governor of Colorado, got together with some other investors from Britain and started to make plans to develop the area. They wanted to bring settlers in, they wanted to, to um, you know, uh, have a booming lumber industry, okay, so exploit the resources of La Sierra. 
but they had this nagging cloud on their deed, which said there was a community that had these land rights. And so they started to think, well, how can we do, how can we deal with this? One, we could ignore them, okay, just kind of ignore them out of existence. Two, we can say, we can market them as a ready, docile labor force for any investor who would invest in this area. Or three, we could just kick them off. Okay, so they're trying to kick them off. In the 1870s, the people of San Luis came together with a, a German, um, German American mark, a market, or market owner at the time, a businessman who spoke English and Spanish and wrote to the New York Times, chastising Blackmore and Gilpin and pretty much shaming them into kind of relenting their efforts. So the community won, okay, they kind of bent it off with an effort to take their land rights away. And then, you know, this is just a summary, just some of the highlights. 1916, during World War I, well, we had both entered at that point, we entered next year. A woman named Bernina Romero um, leads resistance when she hears that the owner of La Sierra, who had changed hands, again, with that cloud on the title, um, has decided to kick the people off, to fence them out of there. And so the ranch manager at the time is a man named Mr. Valentine. He's He's hired by the, the land company, and he's like, the land company's like, get rid of these people. Um, we don't want to deal with them. We want to make them make most of the value of the land. And so Renina hears of this, and she's the first one to grab a rifle, and others grab their rifles as well. And they go find Mr. Valentine, the ranch manager. And by the end of the meeting, and this is all through, you know, some old documents and some oral histories, they um they were able to get him to become a contributing member of the local land rights defense committee. And so they convinced him at that right point. Um, yeah, this is a great work. And then in the interwar years, we have WPA photographers going in, um, we have oral histories of what life is like, it's kind of a lull in the activism because there are no outright attempts to take away the land rights. But that will change in 1960 with the arrival of Jack Taylor, who's a lumber man from North Carolina. And he, you know, he has always like in his eyes, he wants to exploit the, the lumber, the timber on La Sierra for his own profit. And so he comes in by 1861, he's fenced off the entire La Sierra. And so the locals bulldoze the fences down. He puts the fences back up, they bulldoze them down. And so there's literally violence back and forth. Um, there's even one instance where locals went up to the ranch house where Taylor was sleeping and, and shot him. But they shot at his pillow, which normally people would sleep with their head on the pillow, but he happened to sleep with his feet on the pillow or something. Um, and they shot his foot. So back and forth, um, violence, um, and this is all documented through legal activity, through oral histories, and through some community records. And, Newspapers. And then in the mid 1960s, um, the locals hired Eugene Tapley. Those don't really hire him, he works for free. But he's a Denver attorney who, by himself, attempts to tell this whole story to the courts unsuccessfully. I mean, it's an enormous history to, to take to the courts. And in 1965, the courts are not really that open minded. Um, and in 1965, that's when the um, district judge issues his his um, his statement, his ruling that these Mexicans need to be brought into the 20th century. Okay, so I, I did put on here that there was a pistol whipping incident where three young men from the community go up to you know they're just kind of having fun on, on the mountain and they're pistol whipped by the ranch hands, and this leads to Taylor being basically put in jail in San Luis for his own safety because the locals were going to kill him. So there's kind of a lull, you know, that the land rights are extinguished in 1965. Um, and, and there's a lot of despair in the community. There's large out migration, people leave for Pueblo, they leave for Colorado Springs and for Denver to, because they can't make a living without access to La Sierra. But in the mid-1970s, people began to come together. Three activists in particular will come together to found the Land Rights Council. Apoli Rabarello, Shirley Romero Otero, and Ray Otero. So the Land Rights Council would become one of the most successful civil rights organizations, I would say, in American history. 
It was, I mean, it, you'll see, it is very, very successful. And the two men in the, in the middle of this photograph, the, the guy on the left, on the right, it's a holy Rael, and to the left is kind of his, his good friend, Juan Lacombe, who was also not one of the founders, but one of the key activists in the early years of the Land Rights Council. And so what the Land Rights Council does, they say our mission is to regain our rights. They were unlawfully taken from us. And Napoleon Art, he's like a walking historical repository of the community's history. He has everything in his head. He, I mean, he's a brilliant man. Um, I was on this like one person quest to find out everything I could about him because I was so fascinated with, with who he was um, in Colorado history. He's like this key figure I've never even heard of. Um, so this is another picture of Napoleon Arrael, and like I said, he's like the heart and soul of the movement. Uh, carries all of his knowledge in his head, also carries the knowledge of how to environmentally, sustainably use the resources of the area. Okay, so he actually penned, and I, I've seen the documents again in somebody's old bio box, um, of a management plan, the La Sierra management plan, where he lists ways to use La Sierra in more, in more sustainable ways to make it last for generations. And it's this repository of traditional environmental knowledge. It's beautiful. It's just beautiful. Um, and his biggest quote, what is his quote? is, God belongs to God, and we will not. And a short video of the book. Apolina Real is an 82-year-old native of Mosquilla County and an active member of the Land Rights Council, a grassroots organization working to regain the common lands. In 1960, when it goes out, uh, I did a fighting for this land. And I will continue to fight for it as long as I live. The worst of all has been that our own courthouse, the commissioners, and self interested people have placed all the land that was subject to the land grants under taxation. And that has been the cause of its loss. They come and sell 15 to 20,000 acres for $600. And neither the commissioners nor the county gets anything. Some of the thieves takes it all. But here, the ranch is the life of the man. And my advice to young people is to do the same as I did in my time. Life is very sweet. Sweeter than honey. But if one chooses to make life bitter, it will be more bitter than God. We wish to live and let live. He was about 81 or 82 in that video, which was shot in about 1980. And so he's, I mean, that's at that age, pretty remarkable man. And he would say, like he said in the video, he would fight for the land as long as he lived. And he believed in the justice system because he knew the history. He knew the Bopion documents, he knew the promises that were made, and he knew that the courts had done the people wrong. And he was very aware, I mean, he wrote to President Nixon, he wrote to the Colorado senators at the time, he wrote to Governor Lamb, and he spelled out in letters, I've seen the letters, the wonderful, um, the history of the community and the incidents of racism that have been um, practiced upon the community. And he always said that if he was too old to, if, so if the courts failed the community and he was too old to pick up a rifle and, and you know, join the revolution, that he would crawl with the rifle. 
and joined the revolution. So he was a man who believed, who knew his history, who believed in justice, and he was completely to this cause. The next uh, founder of the Land Rights Council is Shin Romero Otero, and I'm sure that some of you have heard her speak. She's a phenomenal public speaker. Um, she's a devoted activist of land rights, uh, environmental sustainability, and um, education, um, equal education. And I have a short video of her. So she was of the gen first generation to be exposed to Chicano studies at Athens State. And she said before that, she didn't really know her history. And so we team up uh, pulling out uh, knowledge of history, just in a lifetime of wisdom, with Shirley's fire and determination at having learned her history and, and anger at having not learned it before, along with Shirley's husband, Ray Otero, who you can see. Um, He's standing up in the back there. And he was a man, a young man from Montrose, Colorado, who was exposed to the teachings of or the activism of Reyes Quintana, and also he worked for Cesar Chavez for a while in California. And he was sent to Vietnam in, in 1964. And he came back injured, but more politicized than ever. He said, you know, we were like many young men, um, George, I saw you earlier in the audience, George Abby. Um, said, you know, we're fighting for democracy abroad, but we don't, we come back as second class citizens here. So he's one of those young Vietnam veterans, Chicano Vietnam veterans, who comes back and picks up the mantle of the Chicano movement. And this is him as an older man. It's very important that all of us, from the niños to the más ancianos, que comiencen a entender lo que les está pasando aquí en este país. Primero comenzaron con robar nuestra tierra y no dejarlos entrar con sus animales, sus familias, para recreo de diferentes modos que se usaba esa tierra por tantos años antes que llegó este animal a arruinarles lo que tienen. So we we know about these activists and we know their contribution, but not enough people do. And so if I were to make a plea for preservation, it would be for their speeches to be preserved, for photographs, for oral traditional art histories to be collected about their, their lives, etc. So it's a really good example of that. Um, and just to go back to the history then of the lawsuits, um, 1981, you know, the, the Point where Agatha shames everyone in the room to signing on to the lawsuit in 1980. Well, they make a case in 1981 in front of the Colorado Supreme Court, and they make three arguments. The attorneys who are shaped by you know, the legal aid program came of age as against legal aid lawyers under the Johnson administration are arguing three things. One, Mexican law and custom that this needs to be taken into account. Well, you can't have this unless you have preservation of history, right? Two is this weird Colorado law of prescription, which says if you occupy a piece of land for 17 years uncontested, that didn't really go very far before. And then the 1863 Bovian document, and it would be the Bovian document that would be the key to victory here. This is just a snapshot of the various pieces of litigation, um, instances of litigation that were already from the courts. You can see, you know, the court rules time and again in Taylor's favor against the community, and the community just not would not give up. Um, you know, Jeff continued to fight on behalf of the community, and I became involved in 1987 for to help prepare for the hearing in the district court to try to get it back in front of the courts after. Um, and you can see in 1994, the Supreme Court said, hey, you were actually done wrong, so we're going to allow you to, to start your case again. And that's 1997 and 1998. 
and they were kind of like um, defeats in, in 97 and 98, but they took it again to, to the appeals court. And in 2002, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the people. This is a remarkable ruling. And if you know anything about Reyes Lopez de Arena, um, he was a friend of, of uh, Rey Otero, and he called him and he said, how many you won? And I didn't. <laughs> so it was, it was kind of a remarkable thing that the community actually won. And they won because of the Bovian document, because they were able to argue that this obscure little document written in 1863 in Spanish, which the earlier court would have nothing of, was relevant here. And that document needed to be put in its proper historical context. And Chief Justice Mary Bularkey was the Chief Justice of the, the Colorado Supreme Court at this time. And I, her husband called me a few months ago asking me a question. And I asked him about his wife's experience with this court case. And he said it was her proudest moment as a judge, that she was so proud to be able to, to take the history to grant these people um, justice. She said it would be the height of arrogance and nothing but a legal fiction that we can interpret this document, or the document without putting in this, it in its historic context. She further stated, it is an understatement to say that this is an injustice. Evidence of necessity, reliance, and intention support a finding of implied rights in the Taylor Ranch. That is huge, right? So she took into account this entire history of use that went back to 18, really 1850, 51-ish, when people understood that they had these use rights, which were, again, the American property system could not grab the movement until 2002. Um, and so the, knowing the, the history of the San Luis land rights struggle really gives us a more complete picture of the Chicano movement. Okay, we often see uh, Visuals like on, on either side here, the Crusade for Justice in New Denver, some of the activism here in Pueblo, um, you know, youth rising up against authority and so forth. But if we dig a little deeper into the documents, into people's shoeboxes, and just do these kind of projects of community history, historical uh, source gathering activities, we'll get out of richer history. This middle thing here, this um, kind of excerpt from a newspaper, is from a newspaper called La Cucaracha, which has recently been, actually I think it might be housed here um, in our digital collection, which was started here in Pueblo in the 1970s with money from the Catholic Church. Um, and Juan Espinosa, who I saw a week right before my talk, um, talked to him briefly. Um, he was one of the founders, as well as David Martinez here. And it was a way for Chicanos to tell their, their stories um, when modern media or mainstream media would not tell their stories. And this article is part of a larger article about a gathering in 1978 of Chicano activists and American Indian activists in Chama, Colorado, so a very rural part of the San Luis area. And it was this remarkable um, process of, of creating this coalition or this alliance between two groups where there was a troubled history. That's their conquest, essentially, right? Um, it's very, very complicated. But they did rituals, they performed different rites um, to say that, you know, they said, a bully in our set at the time, somos Chicanos, somos Indios. We, we are one and we should, you know, we should support one another. And so it's the beginning of a series of coalitions that were built by the Land Rights Council and um, with various groups here. So each of course Rescue, which was a group of um, young white environmental activists from Boulder in the 1990s, so the Communist Party, the Socialist Party, the Black Panthers, Puerto Rican activists, American Indian Movement, and those legal aid attorneys. So one of the ways that this, this community won was through the formation of coalitions. And the the um, the headline of High Country News in September 1996 was a bizarre alliance twice more. Okay, so two groups, you know, one's vegetarian, one is a meat-eating, you know, Hispano community in Southern Colorado, came together over shared values. Um, so it's, I mean, when you when you save, when you gather these sources and you save them and you study them and put them in their proper historic context, 
The story that they reveal is really remarkable. And so, just to sum up that long story of the San Luis, um, when I write struggle, one, I mean, it goes to show the importance of preservation of documents, like the Bobion document, like I said, which would have legal ramifications and ramifications for justice. It was, it was the critical piece of evidence in that trial. Also, the preservation of oral stories to create a fuller picture of people for groups like the San Luis community. They didn't do a whole lot of writing in history now, through the years. And so oral history with many, many people corroborating it with one another and with whatever written um, sources exist or songs or poems or whatever um, can help restore dignity to those historic, historically marginalized communities. And then, of course, through this, we arrive at a truer version of our own history. It's a critical piece of Chicago history. It's a critical piece of our national history. So now I'll just uh, highlight a couple of other projects that are underway. Um, the Sand Creek Massacre, uh, which happened here in Southern Colorado. Um, History Colorado is set to open, reopen the exhibit at 12th and Broadway on, on November 18th to tribes, only tribal members, and then November 19th to the general public. And this is after about a 10 year process of dialogue, negotiation, and working together to tell a more, a more inclusive, more accurate version of what happened at Sand Creek in 1864. And these are just some quotes from the press release that was issued by History Colorado just like less than a month ago. Um, it shows the trust that was built between History Colorado, which is essentially government, and these tribes. And then the second one, historic remembrance, educational awareness, and spiritual unity, a very important thing to shine in the problem of people. So again, this process of telling stories um, takes humility, and it takes time, and it takes, you have to set that time for healing. And then another project um, that I think is really exciting um, that is underway right now is the Amache Internet Camp Preservation Project. So again, in Southeast Colorado, um, and the key players here are students who are calling themselves the Amache Preservation Society, high school students, led by a country teacher, and um, descendants of the Amache, um, the people who were at Amache. And together, they formed the Amache Alliance, um, which is a coalition of people who come together who are whose mission it is to preserve and interpret the the history of Amache and educate all Americans about the forced evacuation and internment of Japanese Americans, and to work together with other organizations to preserve liberty and civil rights for all Americans today. And they have approached District Colorado about taking over the, the historical um, Korean museum at the site, essentially. So it's pretty exciting. And again, it's all about you know, the descendants sending in artifacts that belong to the families um, of the survivors of the Amache camp, you know, with the goal of preservation. And then I wanted to say just a bit about the project that I was involved in, because I talked to Wayne right before I started my talk today. And it was a, and, and Pueblo will do there soon, I think, but it was a historical preservation project that the city of Denver engaged in in collaboration with Mead and Hunt, which is a kind of a public uh, history group. And what it was, was we were trying to tell the history of Denver through significant places in Latino, Chicano, Mexican American history. We chose that title very specifically because of the, you know, a little bit of conflict over names and labels. But it, um, so we told the story of, of restaurants, we told parks, um, art galleries, murals, like we should just talk about murals, um, places like dance clubs, restaurants, places that were key to the Mexican American or Chicano experience in, in Denver. And those, that um, report, which is about 220 pages long, it's a lot of work, um, will be used by the city of Denver to make preservation decisions. So again, the city of Denver realized that, oh, only 2% of all of the, the historic, historic designated landmarks in the city of Denver were communities of color. We need to do something about that. And so this report will be used to make those decisions in the city of Denver. So um, I'll just end then 
with the nature of a single story. So, a quote from Lindy Shay's uh, TED Talk Stories matter, many stories matter. Stories have been used to dispossess and to malign, but stories can also be used to empower and to humanize. Stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. And it is through historical preservation and what we do with that that repairs the dignity of people. So I want to thank you all for, for receiving me today, and I would love to answer any questions you have. Yes. I just had a question about how far back those land rights go that, the, that those people were fighting for. It seems like, tell me if I'm wrong, they would have actually originated during the Spanish colonial period. Well, that area was settled by um, the Mexican people in, in 18. I mean, the city of San Luis was founded in 1851, but the local state about 1849 to 1850 was when the first families started to arrive. So the grant was issued in 43, but the people didn't start arriving until a few years later. So it was the Mexican period. Okay, so there weren't any inhabitants in that area before then? There were a lot. There were Utes, Kyra, and Apache, and I don't know. Yeah. No, no, the Spanish. Yeah. No, none? No. There were none. That's a great question, though. So it gets kind of complicated with the board in this years. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I just have a question about an area in Costilla County, the Forbes Ranch area, um, and part of it now, the San Francisco Ranch area. I mean, what um, relationship did the Forbes have with? Other, I mean, do you know anything about his relationship with others in the county? Um, yeah, yeah, all I knew. I mean, it was always an area that was talked about just separate, and it was it wasn't covered by the, the agreements um, that Bobion had made, so it was always this kind of irrelevant landscape to the people. But that's a really good question. I don't know many of the details around that. So after the 2002 ruling by the Supreme Court, what happened to the land? I mean, how was it reverted back to the people? Yeah, that's a great question. So what they did, the courts required the people to be able to trace their um, their rights to that piece of property. They had to be a property owner that could trace their rights back to 1863 to those deeds that were written down by Bogan. Um, and so that took some time. And then they would be given a key to the ranch. And so in the interim, it changed hands again. I mean, it would change hands a couple more times. And now it's two couples from Texas who are the current owners. And there have always been attempts to stifle those rights or to challenge those rights. But the court made a decision a couple of weeks ago that I heard. And I don't have a lot of the detail. I haven't had time to look at it. But that is over. Like, the people have the rights and they can trace their their property rights back to 1863. So, yeah. And that was part of my question too. What's the current status and how many people have been able to trace their limit or you know, their rights back that far? Sure, I don't have the exact number on me, but I can, I can get it for you if you want to come up. Yeah. Being yeah, a question. Nikki, why, why did Taylor just try to work? Uh, good question. Um, he thought, well, I mean, I think there's some racism going on, right? I mean, there were numerous instances of, of things that were said, things that were done against the people. There's that, which is huge. And then there's also, I mean, I, he, he felt it was his property and his, I mean, he just didn't honor those land rights. He felt it lowered the value of his property. On, on for the food, for the wood, for everything. And did you ever hear about the time that he was shot at and, and they shot from his window and it hit his bed? Yes. And it just, if, if he hadn't been sitting with his head to the feet, mm -hmm. he would have been killed? Yeah. Is that true? That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've talked to numerous people and that is true. I think that kind of does it. Okay, I think I did too. I think that's Further. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wonder if that was more. If you really heard that, that was, that was interesting. Uh, no, I mean, I've seen pictures of him with crutches. So. so, was 
was, uh, I'm going to ask the question. Did anybody ever get uh, charged with trying to kill him? No, no, never. never. So uh, the people have to prove their uh, rights to the land. What happens to that land that was communal land in the sense that nobody really owned it? It was used by the whole community. Is that restored back to its original form, or is that part of the form? So Lassier will remain with those communal land rights as long as the people can trace their land. So that's one. But are you talking about the Vega? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's owned by the county. And so people still have access to that. Um, they can still use it for winter pasture as long as they do their fair share of maintaining and not overgrazing certain parts of it. So going back to what we are on the original intention of exactly. using that land. Exactly. And I have heard in uh only not in that short clip talked about it where you know people have over the years tried to like move fences to give themselves if they boarded it. I've heard, you know, there's been encroaching encroachments upon that land, but I don't know too much about this. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Where is the eighteen sixty three document? Located is it public or private hands? Oh no, it's in public hands. As far as I know, it's still in a D book in the county clerk's office, which it's <laughs> like it should be preserved. So yeah, I mean they're really unless things have changed in the last few years, there really needs to be some funding to to preserve these documents. Any other questions? So no disrespect, Nikki, you were amazing. And I am from that area, and I always love to come and hear amazing speakers like you to teach me more about my history. But the reason I wanted to speak is to follow up on a statement that was made after Lucha's um, presentation. So somebody that love and respect here in Pueblo said that there was this perception that Chicano murals were not being accepted um, for our levy project here in Pueblo, and I did reach out to the person who oversees that, and she just wanted me to share that that statement is untrue. Um, she wants everyone here to know that. They want as much diversity and all cultures represented, and that anybody um, who wants to meet with her to please, um, I, I will share her information, but she says she would never stand for exclusion, and she stands up for the rights of all artists and historic representation, um, and just wanted to make sure that everybody here knew that as well. Okay. Yeah, but there, there's been controversy with those statements too, because in the very beginning there wasn't inclusion. There may be, you know, and and I think I think there there is an attempt, but in the beginning I I, I do remember. So I am with History Colorado as well. I work at the Alpha History Museum. We are more than open to setting up some type of a community conversation with our Chicano community as well as um, the board who oversees the levy project. So we can yeah. fully address that. I, th I think that would be a great idea. And Rob Cerno was starting something on the east side um, about a year and a half ago. So I'm really glad that you know it's always good to bring all this stuff up. And I think that's a great idea what you're talking about. Um, and I, mean, I want, just wanted to mention that in the borderlands of Southern Colorado at El Pueblo History Museum, we have the, the Bovian document there in our exhibit. Well, uh, it was probably right in the original, but if you wanted to see what it looks like and read some of the text, it was at the museum. Thank you for sharing that. Any other questions? Thank you for participating and uh, I know everyone. Thank you. Thank you.